Hi, and welcome to Know Who Drives Return at Boardroom Alpha. I'm your host, Joanna Macris, and today we're really psyched to talk to some folks who are really at the epicenter of the corporate sustainability and net zero movement. Joining us today are John Bissell and Rich Riley, co-CEOs of Origin Materials, which de in June of last year through a combination with Ardius Acquisition Corp. So welcome, gentlemen. Really psyched to have you here. Thanks for having us. Awesome. So um, you two have kind of a unique combination of technology and leadership cred. So would love to get kind of an introduction into, you know, who is John, who is Rich, and how you arrived to Origin. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm John Bissell. I'm uh, one of the founders and uh, the co-CEOs of Origin Materials. So I, I started the company with um, Ryan Smith, our CTO, uh, back in 2008. And uh, we, you know, developed the technology together and, and sort of brought this along along. And, and one of the earliest investors actually in the company was Rich. Um, and Rich has been uh, sort of a, a consigliere in some ways for me over the years. And uh, uh, when it came time to take the company public, it just made sense, right? It, it sort of seemed like the logical conclusion of a, of a long 10 year relationship for, for Rich to come on board and help me lead this thing. Uh, and I'll let Rich talk about his background a little bit. Yeah, and my, my background started on Wall Street and then I, um... Uh, started a, a company where we invented the toolbar, which we sold to Yahoo, and I would spend 13 years sort of rising through the ranks of Yahoo during its um, really significant growth um, and uh, got to run Europe and the Americas and be on the executive management team and really see basically anything that can happen to a public company happened to Yahoo, um, so great <laughs> training grounds, and then went to be CEO of the app Shazam, uh, which we sold to Apple. And um, while well, very different than Origin, similar in that it was a, uh, a truly magical technology um, that needed to find its you know, place in the world and, uh, and find, its, find its stakeholders. And so um, when the opportunity became clear that Origin had proven its technology, that the customer demand was off the charts and that what we needed to do was raise the capital to build the plants, as John alluded to, the partnership was just really clear to let John focus on this technology and all the amazing things it can do and have me come in and help with the fundraising and scaling of the business and, and commercial things. And um, it, it's really been the smoothest partnership that you, you can imagine. Awesome. So let's try to figure out what Origin does here. In my crude language, it's you take plant-based stuff and turn it into carbon negative materials, but I'm sure you can explain that much more eloquently. And so, so just tell us what you're up to. Yeah, no, actually, that's pretty close to it. Um, I think there are, you know, some key elements that are probably worth mentioning. One is that, you know, what we make is, you know, we make carbon, make, uh, uh, carbon negative materials, but, but we can make a lot of them. So, and we do that by making first an intermediate that's a very chemically flexible intermediate that we can then take to all kinds of different things. Um, so you're, you're sort of not wrong. The other is um, uh, we can really take a whole bunch of different feedstocks. So we can take um, you know, waste paper, we can take post consumer corrugated cardboard, we can take um, uh, residual wood residuals, we can take fresh agricultural waste like uh, rice holes, we can take all sorts of stuff. So basically, if it's, if it's generally if it's made out of plants, at some point in its life, we can probably take it. Um, and then the last sort of uh, a defining feature is that this is really a chemical technology, which is a bit unusual in this space. Um, you know, we, we use sort of tried and true processing techniques with new chemistry um, to, to convert those lignocellulosic materials over into our intermediates. And uh, that, that gives us high throughput. It gives us um, uh, predictability and consistency. It gives us you know, the ability to, to take all sorts of stuff that, that would be more challenging to take if you're running a fermentation technology or a gas occasion or something like that. Yeah. So I want to dive into all the end markets, but at a high level as a company, you've been very transparent about the company's ability to reduce carbon emissions. So talk to us, you know, and this is a world where so many companies are getting dinged for lack of disclosure and transparency. So um, talk to us a little bit about what you've shown to the public about how your technology does reduce emissions. Yeah. So our, um, our process results in, in carbon negative materials. And so when you start with, with wood, you know, you're effectively removing CO2 from the atmosphere and then converting that into useful materials. And so people talk about sequestering carbon by, you know, pumping it into the ground. Uh, we're sequestering carbon by making useful products out of it. And so using the carbon that's already out there and taking it away instead of releasing new carbon into the atmosphere. And, you know, one of the things that, that John mentioned, this, this truly is a technology platform. So there are a very wide variety of things we can make. And that's a difference um, versus some other biomaterials companies that are more very specifically focused at you know, a particular material 
or two. Um, this is really a, a very wide range going after this trillion dollar of materials that we think is making a once in a planet transition from fossil based feedstocks to sustainable ones. Yeah, so a lot of the initial attention around PET plastics has been focused on straws and water bottles. So, I mean, first I wanna say, you know, ask you why, why does biodegradable material make up so little of the total packaging that's produced today? I mean, what have been the obstacles? I mean, why have we, we as a society been kind of so core at creating, you know, biodegradable alternatives? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> that's a, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> so um, first, I, I don't think straws are PET, just to just to know you know, bottles are, but and that's actually uh, it, that's a very forgivable kind of um, error if if I if it's an error, which I think it's polystyrene. Um, but the uh, uh, but it, it's forgivable because there there are so many different products that can be made and out of sort of so many different materials, many of which are combinations of materials. So and and each one of those materials has its own sort of unique set of constraints. You know why was that particular one chosen? Well, it's chosen because of its flexibility and its density and it's, you know, gas permeability and, you know, it's resistance to water and whether or not, it, you know, uh, it has um, the right cost profile, all the, you know, processability, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a huge um, set of different constraints on why do we use different materials for different applications. And that plays into what you were just asking on biodegradability. Biodegradability is a feature of the material, mm -hmm. not a feature of the way you make something. Um, and to, in terms of like, you know, is it injection molded or blown or spun or something like that? And so as a consequence, um, you get all the other material properties along with biodegradability most of the time, right? So it's biodegradable, but, you know, maybe it's not as injection moldable as you want. Maybe it doesn't blow the way you want, right? Maybe it doesn't have the right uh, mechanical strength, right? And so basically at, at its core, the reason why there hasn't been a lot more biodegradable material is because it's too expensive and frankly, it doesn't perform particularly well, especially relative to that cost profile in most of the applications, aside from the fact that it's biodegradable. Um, now, obviously, you know, people are working on that and that's a good thing. Um, and in fact, there are some elements around a polymer that we can get to called PEF, polyethylene furanoate, um, which are degradable elements, right? So if it's in the environment, if it's in the water, it will degrade over time. And uh, it does that while retaining a lot of, uh, uh, you know, attractive, characteristics of what you want in a material, right? It's it's strong, it has good gas barrier, it's, a, you know, it's sort of like PET, but but better in some areas, and it's degradable. And so we're, we're excited about that, but that's the short answer as to why it hasn't happened before is because the right material at the right price wasn't available. Makes sense, okay. So let's start first. I mean, I think a lot of the initial fanfare and attention is around kind of the food packaging arena. Um, so you have some, you know, important relationships with Pepsi, Nestle, Danone, you know, talk to us about, um, what you're doing with these companies and, you know, what the relationships look like. Yeah, so we um, were fortunate to have Pepsi, Nestle, and Danone come together. And these are companies that are, you know, uh, arch rivals uh, uh, in the marketplace, um, come together to really, really try to be forward looking around what, what could, how could you get to bio-based, you know, low carbon PET packaging. And so they, as you can imagine, have extensive networks around the world, buy enormous amounts of materials, have their own research capabilities, and they chose Origin. And that was a big moment for the company. And they would go on to invest over $40 million in the company, serve on our board, and really help take our, our technology all the way through to um, blown water bottles that met or exceeded their specs. And it turns out if you can make a water bottle, you can make almost anything out of plastic, which is sort of counterintuitive for people outside of the plastic world, but it's got to be perfectly clear. It's got to be inexpensive. It's got to be food grade. It's got to be able to withstand all kinds of environmental sort of um, um, concerns and things. So it's, um, it, it, was a, it was a big moment for us and it was a really powerful place to, for us to start. And so when we started our going public process, we had orders from those three companies. We had over a billion dollars of demand, but it really was entirely from the packaging space, which were the, the first movers uh, around our technology. Over the last year, we've been excited to extend that um, demand into textiles and apparels. And so when we talk about PET, most of us go straight to the water bottle. More PET is used in what's called polyester fiber, which is extensively used in all of our clothing and carpets and textiles and in your car and everywhere else. And so that's a that's a big market for us to, to move into. Automotive ac applications, industrial applications, and all those kind of things. So we've been able to sort of grow um, grow our packaging business, but grow well beyond our packaging business and across that trillion dollar TAM that I mentioned earlier. 
Right. And across these wide variety of end markets, when you're talking to potential customers, how much of the decision making process is about lowering you know, the cost versus, you know, the drive towards sustainability and reducing emissions? So I think most companies at this point have publicly stated goals around net zero, around various aspects of their sustainability um, game plan. And they're um, in many cases, you know, scrambling to figure out how they're going to achieve those goals. It's been a relatively quick um, change. And, you know, these companies have been doing it one way for a long, long time. And then in a few short years, the game has changed and they are under enormous pressure from their employees, shareholders, customers to prove that they are becoming more sustainable, that they are lowering their carbon footprints. And so that sets off a, a real global scramble to try to solve this problem. And, um, and it's, a, it's not an easy problem to solve. You know, we t we, when you look, talk about a company's net zero journey, first thing you do is switch to renewable power, electrify your transportation fleet, fantastic things, but that's only half your emissions footprint. So for companies that make stuff, the stuff they make is normally about half of their emissions footprint. And so going after that part is what has is, is gotten a lot less investment, a lot less innovation. And that's really where, where we come in with a, uh, an offering that is cost competitive, low carbon. And we decided very intentionally to make it drop in is what they call in the industry, which means it's chemically identical to what you buy now. So you don't have to change your machine tooling, your packaging, you have to change anything. And change, change is really hard at the scale these companies operate. If you show up with a new material. Um, and so that really lets them achieve their sustainability net zero goals with minimal disruption to, um, to the other things they're doing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, how much customization needs to go on between yourselves and the customer? I mean, are they asking for just give, give me a material or do they want more, you know, are, are there, is there more specificity around? Yeah, so what's exciting for us is when you start with uh, our flagship offering is, is chemically identical PET, which means there's not a whole lot to talk about, really. It's the exact same stuff you currently use. And so you can you can mix it in with the other things you're using. You can switch entirely to our stuff. Um, and that's a, that's, that's a great place to start that's really straightforward and has been extensively tested and validated by some of the world's largest buyers of PET, et cetera. We then typically have the conversation of, okay, what else should we be talking about? And that's when we get into next generation PET, like PEF that John mentioned earlier, where you get all the great stuff about PET plus more, better barrier qualities, degradability, a lot of other things like that. And so, but that material requires more testing, more collaboration, um, takes a little bit longer. So it's great for us to be able to start with PET and then start talking about, you know, future, future materials like that. And then we're fortunate to have a, a pretty long menu of, of materials that we can collaborate with, uh, with, with customers. So a lot of times it starts with the drop-in and then figures out how do we move forward on the, on the futuristic products together. Yeah, I'm really curious to learn more about your relationship with Ford. I mean, when you think automotive, that's not an industry that I would immediately identify, you know, your, your company with. So tell us more about, about that relationship. Yeah, so um, Ford is a, a fantastic uh, partner for us. And to, you know, to get to partner with a tier one automotive manufacturer is, uh, is an incredible place to start. You know, when you think about the kind of companies we work with, there's companies like the, the packaging companies, mostly they buy their own materials. They, they, in some cases, make their own materials. They really are close to, to the materials. Then you get into automotive and all of a sudden you've got a much more complicated supply chain, you know, where there's, you know, multiple tiers of suppliers, model years, all these kind of things. And so for companies like ours that, you know, see automotive as an enormous opportunity, we want to navigate that supply chain and fit in at the right place because, you know, the person that actually buys the material we sell maybe a few levels down from Ford in the supply chain, but partnering at the top is one of the best ways to navigate that supply chain. And so that's been great for us. We also last quarter announced a retail partnership. Now you're getting even more complicated supply chains because most retail companies don't have any manufacturing capabilities and it's entirely into a supply chain and many apparel companies are the same way. And so one of the things we're, um, you know, pride ourselves on is our flexibility, our ability to partner with the, with the top level brand. And even if they don't make anything and they don't buy any plastics or any materials of any sort directly to get introduced into their supply chain and, and, and work seamlessly across it. So that's all, all, all skills we're, we're developing.
Yeah, I mean, to your point about being in the right place of the supply chain, um, the company also has some interesting relationships with chemical companies, which, you know, it's, it appears that, you know, it, it's part of that attack strategy of getting earlier on in the cycle. Tell us more about the strategy behind those relationships. Yeah, so we, um, we've always viewed other chemical companies as potential partners and not competitors. Um, and I mean that uh, extensively. Um, we're, we're excited to, um, there's so much we can do together with, with most of them. And we don't, we don't view ourselves as necessarily like any sort of threat to them. We view it as we can, we can work together. And what's been, um, what's happened probably faster than we would have thought is chemical companies that a couple of years ago, maybe weren't thinking about this stuff very much are thinking about it a lot. And, and that's um, principally coming from their customers who are saying, you need to show me decarbonized materials. I want to see your sustainability roadmap and product line. And so then, you know, many of them will quickly turn to us and figure out how we can partner. And for us, it's a great partnership because they can take our intermediate products, add value to them. They have extensive go-to-market capabilities. They really know the end customers. They really know the, the materials and the specs and things like that. And they really can quickly understand what we offer. And so it's a great way for us to drop into a supply chain and have our materials end up in, in much higher value applications than they might have otherwise. So, you know, chemical companies have become among our largest and fastest growing um, partners, which is maybe not what we would have guessed a year ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, critics of PET, they, they tend to focus on the decomposition and they'll say cellulose still needs some sort of industrial type composting to break it down. So what's your reaction, you know, to those naysayers out there? Yeah, so, so a couple things. One, um, PET by far is the best end of life solution we have for, for uh, uh, certainly plastics. I might almost go as far and say materials, right? Um, mechanical materials that we, we use now. Uh, and so I think there's a little bit of, you know, you can always find something that it can do better. Um, and so there's, you know, people are harping on that more so than really taking a realistic approach to like, what are all the options <laughs> and what are you going to do with them? You know, PET gets recycled at rates that are, are, through the roof compared to every other uh, plastic. It's not even remotely close. Um, so I, I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Now that said, let's try to make it better. If it's already the best material, let's do what we can to make it better. That's what we're doing on the front end right now is we're basically taking what's what's by far uh, one of the best materials out there, um, again, if not the best, and we're making it carbon negative. So that takes one big piece, you know, knocks it off. Um, and then as we talked about with, with uh, uh, PEF. Well, it turns out that you can you can um, sort of include that monomer in, and and that that may provide some of the degradability that people are looking for without sacrificing on on other elements of the of the material. So you know we're we're excited about some of the ways to do that. Um, we think that there are some options, um, and we think it can get better than it is right now. But I, you know I think it's probably not realistic to to look at PET and start shooting at PET. The the reality is that it's by it, in fact, everybody should be using PET for everything they possibly can from a, 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 an environmental perspective. Um, and, it, and we are seeing that, by the way. So I'd say what we see right now is a lot of applications and, and brands are moving into PET uh, in every application they can figure out how to do it. Um, they're, not, they're not moving out of it. And they're, you know, thankfully, they're, they're certainly, um, <clears throat> they're focused on the, the real elements of, uh, of PET on that front. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I'd say is, yeah, it, as you know, you mentioned, you know, even when it's made from cellulose, you still have to uh, degrade it. And yeah, or, or sorry, you still have to um, uh, recycle it, deal with it in an end of life way that's appropriate. And that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, I mean, so the other, you know, area of contention is cost of manufacturing, right? So um, I wanted to ask, you know, first, are there any sourcing challenges with wood residuals? I would imagine not, but, um, you know, talk about kind of, uh, sourcing and just you know, manufacturing cost profile relative to other bioplastics? Yeah, so uh, on the sourcing side, so generally speaking, you know, there are lots of residual materials in the world. Um, it's, you know, you, you know, you always want to find a spot where you can get a lot of it economically in one location. So that's, you know, we pay attention to it from that perspective, but it isn't as though we, you know, we look at the global map and we go, geez, there's only, there's only a little bit left. We better get over there, right? There's plenty of it. Um, uh, and that's just for uh, residual wood uh, waste. If you look across the feedstocks, it's sort of mind blowing. I mean, we, we, before we start to tap out on feedstocks, we've probably sort of won the game on decarbonized materials as a species uh, before that happens. So that's one thing to consider. It, on manufacturing costs more broadly, you know, we, we developed this process with, um, with a really strong cost focus in mind all the way through. So 
we're, we're, we're quite cost efficient. Um, and as you look at it, you know, we've always thought that we could be competitive with oil at, at pretty low prices. So, um, and that's talking for, you know, PET and sort of oil replacement materials specifically. Obviously, there's stuff that we can make that oil can't even get to. So how do you sort of, you know, price shop against that? Well, it's a little bit more challenging. But, um, but uh, when you're talking about the oil replacement materials, really, current oil prices are, are fantastic. We are happy to be living here from an economic perspective and cost perspective. And, uh, and you know, frankly, we were happy to, uh, with the environment back in, um, in 2020. So that was a perfectly fine environment. So that gives you a little bit of sense on sort of spread. And we can, we can run pretty far down on, on cost uh, and still feel fine. So that tells you a lot about the cost performance. I think when you're looking at bioplastics more broadly, you know, all these processes are different, right? They have different feedstocks. That's always a good place to look. Um, but, you know, recovery, all that kind of stuff can matter too. And I think uh, the market has shown that there aren't a lot of cost-effective um, bioplastics or, or sort of, let's call it, low-carbon material solutions out there, which is why we thought this is such an opportunity. Yeah. I wanted to just hone in a little bit on, um, you know, your IP and competitive moat, right? I mean, to what extent, can, you know, how... How easy or difficult is it for a competitor to get into this manufacturing process and to you know differentiate itself and just come to market? Yeah, well, first, it's it, developing manufacturing processes like this takes a long time. So you know we've been at it for ten years. We're actually not slow. We're actually pretty fast <laughs> as it goes in the industry. Um, we also have a bunch of intellectual property right that we think is relevant. So so that combination is a is a powerful combination right to have to. It, try to try to innovate your way through if you were going to go try to copy our processes. Um, so we think of it as really having sort of a, a 10 to 12 year head start, if not more, on anybody that wants to jump in and do this now. Um, and, you know, odds are, if, if I know the kinds of companies that could try to attempt to do this, they probably wouldn't start yet. They'd start when we have OM2 running, right? Because they want to take all the risk out of it. So I think, you know, maybe it's not a 12 to 12 year head start, maybe it's 15 year head start, something like that. Um, uh, so that's one. But two is, you know, we're really, we don't think that the way this is going to go is that we've got to go fight and throw elbows on this stuff. We think that actually, you know, the world needs as much of this as it can, as it can get its hands on. And and so our expectation is that we'll actually end up, if somebody wants to get in the business of making, um, you know, low carbon PET, carbon negative PET, uh, they should come talk to us <laughs> and we'll figure out how to build a plant together, right? Um uh, you know, if you look at these, the, the demand for these kinds of materials, um, you know, take take some of the consumer beverage companies alone, you know, Pepsi, Nestle, Danone, that's like several dozen plants, right? 20 plus plants, um, just to satisfy their consumption alone of PET, let alone all the other materials that we can get into. So you're looking at, you're looking at a lot of these plants um, in order to uh, first even keep up with the incremental demand growth, um, plus sort of eventually go back and, and replace the installed base. And, uh, and so, you know, there's got to be a lot of these plants built. And that means that, you know, likely the most efficient way to do that is going to be doing it in part with other companies. Yeah. There's also a lot of noise around alternative biodegradables like PBS and PBAT and that they're cheaper to produce. Like, I don't know how much of that is true. And, you know, I, you know, kind of what are your thoughts and how important right now is it? You know, it just seems like the market is so vast. There's lots of ways to skin the cat. Yeah. How much is cost part of this equation? Well, first, I think, I don't think they're cheaper to produce than us. Um, <laughs> they might be cheaper to produce than some of the other biomaterials out there. Um, but the, uh, uh, it, it, you know, polybutylene toxinate and polybutylene, uh, polybutylene uh, adipate terethylate are both really interesting materials. Um, they're, uh, uh, you know, the challenge with them has always been, you know, we were talking earlier about the sort of constraints around cost, but also biodegradability plus the actual performance of the material. And they've always just been challenged, frankly, in, in competing uh, from a performance and cost perspective against the, the other materials that could go into that spot. You know, we feel really comfortable um, I don't, in fact, I don't know that there are that many spots where we compete with those, with PBAT and PBS specifically, because PET is not the natural sort of go-to replacement polymer for those. I don't, at least I don't think so. Um, there may be some applications where they overlap, but, but so we don't run into those in the market all that much. I mean, they're out there. There's no question about it. And I think they're, I think they're good materials that should be getting out as much as people can get them out there. But, um, but yeah, I don't think, I think we beat them on cost probably by a wide margin. Um, and I think, uh, you know, just from a performance perspective, 
you know, PET um, is, a, is, a, is a different animal, right? PET is also huge. It's, it's a, a multi-hundred billion dollar market um, and it's growing quite quickly. So it's, you know, we're, we're much more focused on going in and replacing sort of fossil-based PET, right? Or taking on uh, demand growth that would have otherwise been fossil-based demand growth than we are trying to sort of fight and throw all those other polymers. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it doesn't appear that there are that many people with significant production volumes yet in this space. You've got like Kanika, Danimer, Pure Cycle. Um, I mean, what is your, like, it's, you know, early in this market is, you know, what, what is your view? Like, is there room for lots of different ways to skin the cat alternative approaches? Or do you feel like it's going to shake out to like one, you know, chosen technology approach? Yeah. So there's no way it's gonna shake out to only one chosen technology approach. There's too many, especially if you, if you grade the sort of, uh, or if you, if, you, if you define the market as all these organic materials, right? Uh, it's just not gonna happen. There's just too many, right? I mean, if you look at it right now, even when you had mass consolidation historically under, you know, IG Farben and then subsequently, you know, Badasha, BASF and DuPont and Dow, right? And they were sort of the only ones out there in some ways, and, uh, sort of. That still, you know, and the world was much smaller and so demand was much less than there are far fewer materials. You still didn't have full consolidation with a single winning technology across all of those different materials. So I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, I do think that there's tons of space and running room for each of these companies in each material, let alone across the whole industry, right? So if you look at, you know, PHAs for Danimer and, and PBS and uh, um, PBAT and PLA, right? And PET, which is bigger than all the rest of those ones combined, I think by a factor of about 100. Um, you, you, there's plenty of space for lots of companies to operate. Now, that said, we think that probably the likely thing is not so much that there are going to be um, more technologies that are brought up in, in PET just because we think that we perform better than the rest of them. Uh, and so we think you're going to get maybe uh, consolidation of the technology under under that area. But, um, but I don't think it's necessary, right? There could be, there could be, five or 10 players, uh, technology players in PET all operating successfully as long as the market supported it, which I think from a demand perspective, it certainly can. Right, and certainly some of the customer announcements across you know, all of you guys are the same folks, right? Uh, so some are, um, and I think that that's uh, a function of demand, right? I mean, Pe I mean Pepsi alone probably has <laughs> sizably more demand than all the all the companies combined are projecting over the course of the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, yeah, I think that there's, I think it's a great big market with lots of running room for a long time for a lot of companies. Yeah, I wanted to hit on, um, you know, you've announced offtake and capacity, capacity reservation agreements totaling, I think 5.6 billion, you know, massive number. Um, help us understand kind of how that figure translates into revenue over time. Yeah, so the 5.6 billion is the the aggregate contractual demand that we had as of our as our last um, update, and um, those those agreements um, will, in some cases, if they're capacity reservations, will convert into offtake agreements. If they're already offtake agreements, then they will be fulfilled as soon as we start manufacturing materials. Our first, you know, plant is scheduled for mechanical completion at the end of this year, and to to start ramping up early next year. And then our, our, our much larger world scale Origin 2 facility is scheduled to come online in 2025 and, um, and then Origin 3 and beyond. And so, you know, as those plants come online, they will be fulfilling that demand and converting that into revenue. Yeah. Have you talked a little bit about kind of the long term operating model? You know, what you see as kind of, um, you know, at, you know, full run rate, you know, what margins look like, what normalized revenue growth looks like? Yeah, we've we've shown some of that in our projections. You know, of course, once we build the plants, we'll see what the we'll see what it really looks like. But the, uh, but yeah, we we think that we have a uh, you know, as we talked about earlier, even in at twenty twenty sort of pricing, um, we think that which was a little bit you know a little bit of a different world than it is today. Um, uh, we think that our margins are, are quite strong. You know, you're talking sort of circa fifty percent EBITDA margins on the on the plants, um, and you know since we're not even going to come close to touching sort of overall demand with the supply that we're bringing on even through the end of the decade, you know, I, I don't think that, of course, you're going to see some movement in those, uh, in those market uh, pricing, but um, I don't think that we're going to have a significant effect on the overall pricing picture. Um, although, you know, we do see actually, uh, we do, obviously we're a scarce resource, right? If there's 
there's so much demand and it all wants to move to ESG and we can bring on only our, our capacity over time, you know, that gets reflected in price uh, to a certain extent, um, positively. But, um, uh, but yeah, so I think we'll have, we'll, we expect to have good margins all the way through. And frankly, as we can move to some materials that are, you know, PET plus some of this, this sort of uh, what Rich called more futuristic materials earlier, um, I think that, you know, that, that should be accretive to margin. Yeah. So just thinking about what you guys are really focused on right now, it would seem to me, you know, getting the manufacturing up, Origin One supposed to be completed, I think, at the end of next year. So just to kind of update us on progress and kind of where you see the manufacturing rollout. Yeah, we uh, that's e exactly right. So um, end of this year, we expect to have Origin One complete, and then uh, middle of twenty twenty five, Origin Two. Um, we've had great progress. Um, you know, obviously the the world of supply chains and uh, has been quite interesting <laughs> the course of the last year. But our, our team has really done a great job navigating through that um, for Origin One, and uh, and you know we're we've hit all of our milestones early, pretty much uh, so far on that project. So feeling pretty comfortable, you know, given some of the the choppy waters around uh, 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 supply markets, we're we're not we're not really um, you know we haven't communicated anything beyond each milestone as we hit it early. Then we'll tell people about it. But uh, so we're expected to still have that Origin One plant. Uh, uh, online at the end of the year, and we're excited to bring it online. You know, it's going to be great, and uh, you can see some pictures and stuff like that on our website. Some of our prior presentations. It's it's a real plant. You know, it's, it, sometimes people talk about it like it's it's small, but it's actually it's it's, it's quite sizable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you are a company that chose to go via the SPAC route in terms of becoming a public company, and as you know, there's lots of scrutiny and potential, you know, regulatory changes that might be happening in the space. So, kind of, just talk to us about why you chose the SPAC route and your experience, um, you know, as, as as a public company. Yeah, so uh, the SPAC route for us was um, it just sort of made sense at the time, given sort of timing and and you know what 2020 and 2021 were like. It just felt like the sort of the route that, that was uh, rational. Um, you know, there were some components to it that I think were great for us. One is that um, our sponsor could do extraordinarily uh, deep diligence on us. So, so we spent, you know, months in the, in the diligence process with them. Uh, lots and lots of sophisticated folks coming through, um, really understanding where we were, uh, what we were doing, um, uh, you know, from a technical perspective, a market perspective, I mean, it was really, it was, uh, um, it was a really first class kind of process. Um, and uh, our, our SPAC sponsors have actually, you know, stayed close to the company all the way through. Um, we still work with them, you know, very, very closely, uh, really enjoy it. And, and for us, it was, it was a lot about, you know, who, who are the partners um, that you're, you're bringing on. And I think in that sense, you know, we sort of, Use the SPAC process the way that it was intended on paper. I'm not, you know, it was like the, the idealized version of a SPAC process is kind of what we experienced, honestly. Um, and you can sort of see that in the level of engagement from our from our SPAC sponsors that we've had since even since deal uh, consummation. That makes sense. Um, so, as you know, in your life as a D SPAC, your stock has done what has been a kind of familiar pattern of you know this and this, right? And so, obviously, there's the macro. You're an early stage growth company. You know, profitability and revenues are in the future. Like we get all of that. Um, you know, as you think about you know communicating the story to investors now, like what do you think is misunderstood? Um, you know, what do you think people are are not getting? You know, when you look at the valuation and think about you know all the stuff that you're doing. Yeah, well, you know, we've our, our story really has um, been unchanged since we first started telling it to public markets uh, over a year ago. In terms of this, this is who we are. This is what we in, what we intend to do, and we've been doing it. And in, in many cases, we've done it a little faster than we said we would. And certainly, in, in the growth of our demand, that's grown a lot faster than I think anybody would have expected. So, you, you could, um, I think, you could credibly argue our story is only better today than it was a year ago. And, and as you said, the market has chosen to value that story at, at very different um, levels over that journey. But what we're focused on is executing that plan and continuing to, to, to build these plants, advance this technology, engage more customers, bring on more demand, and uh, and keep telling our story. And, you know, um, as you said, when markets go risk off, if a company is, you know, pre-revenue, that kind of stuff, you know, you get, you get, kind of thrown into one bucket. And so I think it's likely we've, we've um, 
been cast with that to, to some extent, but that doesn't discourage us. You know, we uh, couldn't be more excited about the, the technology and the future and, um, you know, think we're going to build a massive company here that's going to have a massive impact uh, on the on the planet. So we're, uh, we're, we're more excited than ever. Awesome. Um, what do you guys do when you're not, you know, running this business? Tell us something about yourselves personally. Well, I, I have a two and a half year old, so that <laughs> occupies a substantial amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> And I have four teenagers, so um, <laughs> same same time commitment, just slightly different. <laughs> right. We're just living in my future. <laughs> well, at least one of them. <laughs> uh, well, it was really awesome hearing your story. We'll be watching what you're up to and just really a pleasure talking to you both. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks for having us.